Hello, everybody. We are on the very, very last video of the semester. I'm sure everybody's really excited about that. And we are going to do a couple of different things in this last topic. The first is um, we're going to discuss the codes of nomenclature. And what those are is they are established sets of rules that exist for when we have to name species. So I am really fond of this topic. I have had the wonderful experience of naming species and also naming a new genus. When you describe a new species, you also usually have to describe a new genus unless the genus in which that species fits is already in existence. So on this very first slide, you'll notice a set of three different scallops and the very first experience that I had outside of insects that had to do with describing species was this project where I worked in the lab and we looked at scallop diversity. And one of the first things that, that um, the researchers in this lab did, some of my colleagues, was they did a phylogenetic analysis of all the known scallops, of which there are over 700 different species, and there is a genus named Amusium. What happened is the genus Amusium appeared several times in the phylogeny. It didn't appear in just one clade, which was suggesting that Amusium is not a monophyletic group. And that forced us to have to think about what do we do with this non-monophyletic group of scallops that are supposedly all supposed to be in the same genus. And so what that did is it forced us to think about how we might describe a new genus. So we actually took some of the species from one of the clades in which that genus belongs and we gave it a new name. So the old genus still exists in part of the phylogeny and we gave the other smaller clade that contained some of those species a new name. And so we'll talk a little bit about the practice that goes into naming species. We won't go into all of the rules that go along with the Latinization of the names of species, but you'll get an idea of, of the process and the procedure behind it. So. What we're going to do first is talk a little bit about the codes and the history of the codes that exist. So codes of nomenclature are basically a set of rules that have been published by biologists who care about these things. They are taxonomists and nomenclature is basically a fancy term for naming things. And so they're codes for naming things. They are a set of rules for naming. All right, and so a lot of these codes are taxon specific. So there is a code for, say, animals, and there is a code for plants, there is a code for bacteria, and so on and so forth. So the codes of nomenclature are codes that govern taxonomic nomenclature, the naming of living organisms, and those codes again are taxon specific. In addition, these codes are based on Linnaean nomenclature. The beginning of what we know as taxonomy today in terms of a, a cutoff date or a starting date is 1758. And if you all think back to some of the beginning topics of the semester, we talked about Linnaeus's Systema Naturae, where he finally used binomial nomenclature, the use of a genus and a species name or a species epithet, the binomial name, two names for a species, and he published that in 1758. Any species that has been described before 1758 is basically not valid any longer. So Linnaeus basically came up with a new system and anything before his system is null and void. So remember the year 1758, all of the current codes of nomenclature are based on that starting date of 1758. And then the codes of nomenclature they follow the same rules and the same ranking rules as the Linnaean system. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And then there are some intermediates, for example, 
you might at times have, for example, you might at times have subspecies, which is not a formal category that Linnaeus proposed, but it, but they exist, right? And you might have a subgenus or a subfamily, and so on and so on. Naming must follow the rules of these codes that have been laid out. So let's talk a little bit about the code itself, just a little bit of history. Linnaeus is the first to provide a system that we still use today, the natural system, which is the Systema Naturae, and that was established in 1758. And the very first code that was based on Linnaeus's system was established in the 1840s. So quite a bit later, right? Almost a hundred years later, Hugh Strickland was the person responsible for establishing a list of guidelines. All Linnaeus did was he proposed the binomial nomenclature system that then became the norm for biologists to use. Hugh Strickland proposed the very first code. So these are the rules that you have to follow when you're naming species. Currently, there is a zoological code that we will talk about. Zoological meaning we're talking about animals. And the code for animals has been published and republished and updated several times. The current code that we use today, its very first version was published in 1961 and then updated a couple of times after that. The most recent update to the code was in 1999. So there are different codes. We were talking just on this last slide about the animal code, but what about other organisms? We are going to focus mostly on animals, but I do want you to know that there are other systems in place, and these other systems have different sets of rules. First, the one that we are going to focus on is the ICZN, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. And then we have the ICNCP, that's a fun one, the International Code of Nomenclature for Cultivated Plants. So these are plants that are cultivated by man. We also have the ICN, which is the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants. And built into that code is the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, which would apply mostly to plants. That is the ICBN. And we also have the ICNB, which is the International Code of Nomenclature of Bacteria. So there is a separate naming system and rule system for bacteria. Those function very differently, right, because bacteria have many strains, and so there's different rules about how we name those strains. We will not talk about those rules. And then we have the ICTV or the CVCN, known as the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses Code. Um, and so that is the code of virus classification and nomenclature. Okay, so long names. But I do want you to understand that for different groups of organisms, there are different codes. And again, we will talk only about the animal code. So the other codes, really quickly, just to give you an idea of when they got started, are the plant and mycology or fungal code started in 1753. The zoological code, again, began in 1758, the codes that we use today, although the official code wasn't published until the 1840s or so, but we follow Linnaean rules. Spiders was published in 1757. They had their own code, their own um, spider-specific, arachnologist-specific code. Bacteriology didn't see a code in place until 1980. That is really recent, and you can understand why that would happen, right? Bacteria are a difficult group of organisms, and there are so many different kinds. Bacteria are probably the most diverse group of organisms on our planet, and viruses might even eclipse that, although many people don't assume viruses are living. Virus code appeared in 1971. And then one similarity between all these codes that I want you to, to note and really think about this is that no code, none, none of the codes that we've talked about for any tax, taxonomic group applies to taxa lower than the subspecies level or higher than superfamily. 
or in the case of plants, the family level. A super family is just an additional category that has been added because there are so many different organisms and you end up having to create additional subcategories or super categories. Okay, so any of the codes do not apply to anything above family. The codes do not govern rules about the order or a phylum or a kingdom as a whole but each kingdom, if you will, does have its own separate code. I am going to walk you through an example of how one would describe a species. And I can post for you an example of what a species description would look like. I have done a couple of these in different groups of organisms, mostly focused on insects, but I want you to see just what that looks like. So we are gonna assume that I discovered what I believe to be a unique beetle. Now, you might have seen a beetle like this before. This is a stag beetle. And let's say that I am so good at this particular group of beetles, I am a taxonomic expert, which is often required, by the way, before you can start describing things. You have to know that what you're looking at is unique, right? So let's say that I discover this new beetle. I collected it right in my backyard, right out the window outside. I was sitting on the deck one day and I saw a beetle crawling on one of the trees in our backyard. So I picked up the beetle and it looked familiar to me, but what I noticed most was that it had these orange spots on its, on its prothorax, on its pronotum. So um, I will use my tablet to kind of highlight some of the pieces and the parts. Now, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what a person, a taxonomist would be doing is they are gonna be looking at their critter or whatever it is they found, a plant or a fungus, and you have to be very observant and basically study every single feature to make sure that what you have is a new species. And let's say that I have, I've examined the antennae, and one thing that I know about stag beetles, and so this is a stag beetle. I know that it's a stag beetle. It's got all the, the features of a stag beetle, the large mandibles, which are over here. Um, and you will also notice that there's a little tooth on the inside of that mandible right over here. We also have clubbed antennae. So this is a club and you can count the number of antennomeres, et cetera, et cetera. And so let's say that I've decided, okay, this is definitely a stag beetle. And let's say that I'm really examining this beetle and I discover something really interesting, which is kind of obvious, but I've been paying attention to some of the other more typical features. But if you take a look, there are these little orange spots on the pronotum. The pronotum is this structure behind the head. So this is the pronotum. And then behind the pronotum, these are the elytra. The elytra are the four wings, the front set of wings that have been modified into these shield-like structures. And underneath the four wings are the hind wings. And those allow a beetle to fly. So I think that this is a new species. I know it's a stag beetle and um, these little dots are very unique. I also think I have an idea of which genus this beetle might belong in based on my own personal experience. So what are we gonna do with this, this new species? What do I need to do to describe this species and make its name available for use? So, so I have to describe it. There's a set of rules I have to follow and I have to do it in a way that fits the code, matches the code, and if you do that properly, the name then becomes available. Available is an actual term used in the code. That means that that name can now be used by other scientists. Before that name is, is provided or published, the name is unavailable. So I know based on my prior experience and say my expertise in these beetles that I am working with a stag beetle and it belongs in the kingdom Animalia. So it's an animal, which means I have to use the animal code. It's an arthropod, that is the phylum. It's an insect, which is the class, and it is within the order Coleoptera. 
It is a beetle. Coleoptera means beetle. I know that it belongs in the family Lucanidae. Remember, everybody, that I-D-A-E is the suffix for a family. I also happen to know, because I think I know what the genus is, that the subfamily is I-N-A-E. So subfamilies in the animal code and in animal nomenclature always end in I-N-A-E and families end in I-D-A-E. I also think, based on all the features that I have looked at, that this particular species, which is new, belongs to the genus Dorcas. That's kind of a funny genus name, but that is what it is. And what you might notice here right next to the genus name is a name Maclay 1819. That means that this genus was described by a man by the name of Maclay. I happen to know it's a man, it could have been a woman. Um, and he described this genus in 1819. So we know that that fits and that that name is appropriate because 1758 is our starting date for nomenclature. So it is a valid name. And I also happen to know that there are currently two species of Dorcas in the United States. And neither of them have those orange spots on them. There are many other species of Dorcas in the world, but there's only two in the United States. So um, I have a new species. So after a lot of work in the lab, perhaps dissecting, looking at things under the microscope, I know that this is a new species. And here are a couple of the, the rules that I have to follow in order to describe the species. So I'm going to walk through these. In addition to the rules, I will also be giving you a handout or providing you a handout online that gives you a list of all the terms and the rules as well. So a new species, once it has been discovered and you know that it's new and you've checked with other collections uh, to see if perhaps others have been collected that don't have a name assigned to them, because it could have been that someone described it before, right? But somehow you can't find the name anywhere, published anywhere. There's a couple of basic rules that we have to follow. Number one, the taxon, which is this new species that we just discovered, must be given a name based on the 26 letters in the Latin alphabet. That means that you have to use the letters A through Z. You are not allowed to use any other special characters or accent marks or numbers. You have to use A through Z. If you are describing a new species, you have to use a binomial, which means you have to give it a genus and a species name. If the species you are describing belongs in a genus that currently exists already, that's a little bit easier. But if you're describing a new genus and a species, then you literally have to describe the genus and the species separately, but in the same publication. Um, if you are describing a new family, that gets a uninomial, which means the family name just has a single a name, right? Like Lucanidae would be the family. And the species epithet, so that's the species part of the name, should be an adjective of the genus name. For example, if we think of Homo sapiens, Homo means human and sapiens means wise. So very often the species epithet will be an adjective or a descriptor for the genus name. Homo sapiens is wise man. Homo erectus is erect man, right? So that gives you an idea of how those names work. And there's also a bunch of other rules to follow about how you actually construct a genus and a species name. You have to use specific declensions and grammatical rules with Latin. We will not go over those because I'm not going to ask you to describe new species. Number two, the name that you are giving that species must be unique. In other words, it cannot be a homonym. A homonym means that something or two things have the same name. This is also known as the principle of homonymy. So for example, if there's already a Dorcas 
and whatever species name I'm going to give this thing that exists, I can't use that name again. The name has already been occupied. So you can only use the same genus species combination once. Okay. Let's say that I decide that I am going to name this Dorcas by Maculatus, which means two spots, the two spots on its pronotum. No one else is allowed to use Dorcas by Maculatus. However, someone could describe if they have a different genus, Canthon by Maculatus. The genus species combination cannot be reused, but you're allowed to use the same species epithet by Maculatus multiple times. There are so many species named something Pennsylvanicus because they were described originally from Pennsylvania. So you're allowed to use the same species epithet. You're just not allowed to use the same genus species combination. A couple of additional rules are number three, that the description, so your species description is you're giving the species a name. Um, it must be based on at least one name bearing type specimen. This is known as the principle of typification or typification. What this means is that in your description, you have to designate a specimen, a physical specimen, typically, as the type for that species. It is the specimen that you are using to describe that new species. So the description must be based on at least one actual physical specimen. And that specimen should be deposited in a collection somewhere where someone can go study it. Number four, it should include, your description should include a proper diagnosis. In other words, you have to tell other people who are going to be reading your paper or who might find this beetle out in the world and want to use your paper as a reference, you have to provide a diagnosis. How is this species different from another? And how would you, how would you distinguish it? So you have to identify the distinguishing features. Distinguishing features. And you all will notice here that in the description of these species, we are pretty much using morphology purely. Nowadays, we can also go and look at uh, DNA sequences and look at how similar species are relative to one another, but then we get into the issue of how many nucleotide differences do we need in order to call something a new species. The next rule on this slide is that the description must be published in a work that is obtainable in numerous identical copies as a permanent scientific record. Nowadays, that is easy to do, but back in the day, and even every now and then today, there are people that describe species and publish it in the most obscure of, of journals that are um, hard to find and that might have to be translated into English from a different language. That happens fairly frequently. So it has to be published. You have to make the species name available for people to use. The reason that I have Linnaeus over here on the left on the slide is because Linnaeus himself described thousands of species and Linnaeus himself was actually the type specimen for our species, Homo sapiens. Isn't that funny? So Homo sapiens, which he gave a name to, Homo sapiens, which is our species, he, this man right here, is the type specimen for Homo sapiens. So if you want to go look at what an original Homo sapiens was described as, it would be Linnaeus and you would have to dig up his grave probably to find it. But hopefully he included a nice description of himself or what humans are supposed to look like. Finally, there's some other things that I want you to pay attention to. The name that you give a new species might be a tautonym. A tautonym is when you have something like this. Gorilla, gorilla. Gorilla, gorilla is a tautonym. It means that the species epithet, gorilla, is the same as the genus name. And so gorilla, gorilla 
is allowed if you are working with animals. Tautonyms are not allowed in plants. Not allowed. So that rule has to be followed. So you can use a tautonym, no, no issues there. Once a description is published, um, according to the code rules, we say then that the species name or the name is available. It can now be used publicly by scientists or by someone else. I'm going to flip to the last one here. The names published before 1758 are not valid. And so anytime that you go back and you're looking at species names, anything published before 1758 or anything described before then is not valid. And most likely Linnaeus gave it a new name and then published it in 1758. And then finally, let me get back to this point. Whenever you describe a new species, so let's say that you describe a new species, whatever that might be, and um, you are also describing a new genus. Remember that every species must belong to a genus. You can't just give something a species epithet. You can't just describe sapiens, right? It has to fit under a, a genus category. So let's say that you describe a new species and you also happen to describe a new genus because that new species doesn't seem to fit with any, with any existing genera that exist currently. When you describe a new genus, with its new species, this species becomes the type species for that genus. This new species becomes the type species for that genus. So when you describe a new genus and a new species, that species, if it's the first one ever to have been described as part of that genus, it is the type species of the genus. Sometimes we also call that a nominal species, the nominal species for a genus. So that's something to keep in mind. We will come back to that. And then we also have type or nominal genera. So type or nominal, these are the same thing. If we have, say, a new genus that we, that we are describing, and we happen to know that that new genus is part of a new family, that has never been described. So something really, really unique. The new genus, if it is the first genus ever to have been described as part of this new family, then this would be known as the type genus or the nominal genus. Let me give you an example of what that might look like. Let's say that you describe a new um, family called Octopidae or Octopidae, you're allowed to pronounce it that way. What often happens is that the genus name will closely match that family name. So the genus, the type genus for pretty much any family will look exactly like the family name. They will have the same root, which is octope or octop. And the U-S is a suffix, and the I-D-A-E means family. The type genus for a family will also always look identical to the family itself. So, so keep that in mind. You will also notice if you've got a type species within a genus, let's say the genus's name is, um, is Dorcas. So if we just take the genus name for the stag beetle, its type species name might be Dorcas as well. That is sometimes the case, but not always. So Dorcas, 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 the species epithet, that species within this genus would be its type species. Whenever you see a family, Octopidae, which is actually the family for octopi or octopuses, octopus is the genus name for the octopids. It is the, the type genus name. So you can think of really any, any family name. Think of, say, the canidae or the, the canids. What do you think the type genus, the first genus was that was described within the canidae? You got it. Canis. Oops. Canis with an I-S. This should be canis. 
And you can do that over and over for a bunch of different groups. So Canis happens to be the type genus for Canidae. It was the very first genus described in that family. So hopefully that makes sense. I will give you some practice where you can practice these different names. Here's a couple of other things to note that should be included in a description. The author's name should always be included. So for example, if I have decided I'm giving this, this name and this is Dorcas, remember it's got these bright orange spots, which I forgot to include. Let's say that I decided that this is a new species in the existing genus Dorcas and I am naming it back by Maculatum or by Maculatus. Um, I'll just use that. By meaning to and bacula, referring to the spots on the pronotum. In the description, after that will go Meinhardt, and that's always something special, and then 2020. So one thing that's nice about this is whenever you're talking about this particular species, the author name stays with it. It's a, like a tag that stays with that species name in case it gets moved to another genus. So the author is the person who described it. This is the author and that is the person who described it. We also call that the authority. We also need a year of the description that always goes behind it. That is important. Um, I will get to that point in a little bit. It is very good to know when exactly a species was described. Okay. In addition to everything that we've talked about already, you also need a list of all of your type specimens. So the specimens that are actually included in your description and the localities of those specimens. If this is a new species, I need to provide this information because someone might collect this beetle in, say, Alaska. Is it the same species? You don't know. So it's always important to include as much information as you can. A holotype is basically the representative type specimen, representative type specimen that is assigned to, to that new species. So if someone wanted to go back and look at that species because they think maybe they found the same thing, but they want to compare, they will go to a museum where these type specimens are sitting and the holotype will be the one that you use for the description. The holotype is the one you used for the description. Paratypes are additional, additional specimens that were also collected along with a holotype. Additional specimens that are part of this series that you collected. Part of the series. So they come along with the holotype. And oftentimes, what happens is you'll collect one, one individual. So all you have is a holotype. One nice thing about collecting a series of individual specimens, which is always what I encourage my students to do in entomology, if you collect a series, that means that if the holotype gets lost, you can actually assign one of the paratypes as the new holotype. And in that case, it's called a lectotype. I will provide these terms for you. You also need deposition information. So in which museum or collection has have these types been deposited? So where are the types? You all probably had no idea that behind the scenes, hidden at a lot of universities and colleges, are insect collections that bear types. And we're not just talking about insects, we have types for mammals, types for plants. Every single species that has ever been described has a type somewhere, a holotype. Oftentimes the holotype gets lost. And so there are paratypes that are then used to re-describe that species. Let's say that you describe a new species all you had was a holotype and you had no paratypes, what would happen then is that someone would have to go and designate a whole new specimen as the new holotype for that species. Last year, 
There was a big natural history museum in Brazil that burned, and there were thousands of specimens that were lost, a lot of types that were lost. And so think about the importance of these types. They are the original specimens used for the description of species or genera or families, and those data are lost forever. It's very, very sad when that happens. In addition to your description and the, the other information listed up here, it's always good to have drawings or pictures so that people can see what your specimens look like. Nowadays, this is required um, to have drawings or pictures, and I will attach to Moodle for you one of my own descriptions so you can see what those look like. And now the name is available for use. Yes. It has been published, the name has been registered by the ICZN, and we can now use that in publications. Excellent. Finally, we're going to get to a, a scenario that happens quite often. What happens if the same species is described more than once? Let's walk through two scenarios. The first scenario is that the same author, so let's say me, described two or more species and they should be only one. Let's say that I collected a series of butterflies, and I'm not a butterfly expert, so I wouldn't feel comfortable describing these, but let's just assume in some other universe that I am a really good butterfly taxonomist, and I collected a whole series of butterflies, so I can draw some pictures here. Here are some butterflies. I'll just draw the bodies first. Pew pew, pew pew. You guys get the general idea, and we've got these are butterflies that have only four legs. Yes, those exist. Okay, and yes, don't worry, I will draw some wings. Pew pew. All right, and then what I what I notice when I'm looking at these butterflies, so they've got four wings. I collected say four of them in the same area, but. I noticed that there that there is some variation in the the spots that you find on their wings. On this first butterfly, where is my cursor? There we go. On this first butterfly, I noticed some yellow spots here on the tips of the front four wings. Oops. On the second butterfly, the spots are very faint. They're hardly there. On this third butterfly, there are no spots, and on this fourth butterfly, there are no spots. Interesting. So first butterfly has large spots, the second one barely has any, and then the last two don't. So I decide, in my infinite butterfly knowledge and wisdom, I decide that I am going to describe, instead, I'm going to describe this as a unique species, species 1. I'm going to do this as species 2 and these are species three. And they look very similar, and I collected them in the same area, and they, you know, they have the same behavior, so I'm going to put them all in the genus. So genus Hypotheticus. But there are three different species, and I'm not going to go into the species names. So I just decide that there are three different species. Then, a couple of years later, another author comes around, and they are doing a big study on these butterflies, and they come and study my specimens, and they've been working on these types of butterflies for years, and they look at my specimens and they say, these aren't different, these are all the same. So what do we do now? I have literally given what should be one butterfly species three different names. So that is one example of where this might happen. Me, as an author, might have given two or more different names to one species. Um, another example, another scenario might be that two or more different authors, so different scientists, accidentally describe the same species but give it different names. So let's say in 1905, John describes this little, this little flea-like thing. I'm just going to draw it like that. And then in 1932 or 33, let's do that. Um, Sally Sue describes the same flea-like thing, but they didn't realize Sally Sue. So this is Sue and this is John, let's say Stamos, just for kicks. Sally Sue 
for some reason, she didn't find the description of John Stamos's flea, flea-like insect. So she described this thing that she discovered on a trip to, say, Costa Rica, and she gave it a new name. Turns out that John Stamos had already described it, and here comes Sue, and she gives the same thing a different name. What do you do? So let's talk about, about what, what happens then. I will come back to this at the very end, but let's talk about a different scenario. Let's talk a little bit about Brontosaurus. This is a pretty bad picture, but I put it up here so you can all recognize what movie this is from. Obviously, Jurassic Park. Brontosaurus is this long-necked herbivore, this herbivorous dinosaur that was described by a man by the name of Marsh in 1879. Here it is, remember that date. Here's another dinosaur by the name of Apatosaurus. So these are just genus names. But Marsh also described Apatosaurus in 1877. Brontosaurus was described by the same author in, by Marsh in 1879. And here, Two years earlier, he had described Apatosaurus. What happened first is that there was a, a man by the name of Riggs who came in and in 1903, so this is quite a, quite a couple of decades later, Riggs comes in and he says, hey, Brontosaurus is the same thing as Apatosaurus. So a synonym sounds very similar to English language. A synonym is when two or more names are given to the same species. To the same species, usually by accident um, or because someone else is coming along now and saying that the two, two genera or two groups are the same thing. There are different kinds of synonyms, but we'll just keep it simple here. Riggs basically says that Brontosaurus is really just a smaller Apatosaurus. So he is synonymizing Brontosaurus with Apatosaurus. Now, why would he pick Apatosaurus over Brontosaurus? Why not say Apatosaurus is actually a Brontosaurus? And this is where the rule of the principle of priority comes in. The principle of priority. The oldest name, the oldest name or the one described first is given priority. It is the principle of priority. In other words, the oldest name, the first name used for the same species in which there might be two given names is given priority. Since Apatosaurus was described in 1877 and Brontosaurus was described in 1879, Apatosaurus gets priority. So this is the reason why Riggs, after he was studying these dinosaurs, he decided, you know what, these two look too similar, so Brontosaurus really no longer exists. I am now going to recognize only Apatosaurus. And so this was published, and for a long time it was accepted. Brontosaurus then no longer existed as a name. It had been synonymized, which is what this synonymizes refers to. When a species or a genus is synonymized with another, and these are genera, right? They're not species, but they're two generic names. When a genus or a species is synonymized, its name is no longer valid. You can no longer use that name. In 2015, a new paper was published. This is the one I will share with you. And Brontosaurus was brought back because there was a group of scientists that went back and studied a bunch of specimens in different museums, and they looked at over 400 features, new characters, morphological features, and they decided based on structures and length and width of the neck that Brontosaurus actually is a unique genus, and so they resurrected Brontosaurus. So Brontosaurus is now still a valid name. One thing I want to mention is that you will sometimes notice 
a name of an author in parentheses. So let's say that you've got, I'm just, I'm just going to make this up. Homo bigo. Okay, this is not a real species. I'm just making this up. And in parentheses, you see Linnaeus and then 1758. What this means when there is an author and a year, the authorship and the year in parentheses, it means that this species, Big O, which is now in Homo, probably belonged in a different genus. Linnaeus might have put it in a genus, let's say Pongo. So Linnaeus originally might have described it as Pongo Big O, some weird big ape. But later, someone else came along and moved Big O, just the species, into Homo. So what happens then is the author, the original author of the species, just the species, gets put in parentheses because remember that author name is always tagged along with the species so that we know that this was Linnaeus's Big O that was described. So pay attention to that. You will sometimes notice it. That's just a little detail that I thought I would share with you. So what I want to come back to for just a quick little bit of practice, back to these two original scenarios, is think about what would happen to these three different species, species one, two, and three, that I might have described. Once these three different species now become one species, in other words, they get synonymized, you have to decide which of the three species names, species one, you are going to accept. If the species got described in the same paper in the same year, you can basically choose which one gets the priority. But if, say, species one, two, and three were described in three different years, but actually they belong in the same genus, the one that was described first is the one that gets priority. So let's say that we describe, we describe this first one as Hypotheticus, Hypotheticus orangii, okay, because of those orange spots. And species two has a different name and species three has a different name, but Hypotheticus orangii was described first, say in um, 2018, and species two was described in 20, uh, 19. Species 3 was also described in 2019, but perhaps in a, in a later paper in a different month. Hypotheticus oringii gets priority, which means that species 2, whatever its name was, and species 3 have now been synonymized with Hypotheticus oringii. Their names are no longer valid. They are synonyms of Hypotheticus oringii. And back to the John Stamos and Sue picture here, this scenario, John Stamos's description, that name, whatever it was, gets priority over Sue's description, unless for some reason Sue's name got became so popular and everybody's use, using this name and changing it back to Stamos's name would just be too difficult for people to get used to. That is actually a rule that um, that exists in the code. If it's too difficult to use a name that no one's ever used before because no one actually saw Stamos's original description, it was published in some obscure journal in Romania, then Sue's name could be the valid name. So um, what I will be doing for you all is posting some practice questions based on the code they will be really fun. They are like a puzzle. And I want you to think about authorship. I want you to think about the rules of publishing or describing a species. I will post for you an example of a species description. And then I also want you to understand some of the terms that I threw out, like tautonomy, homonymy, priority, um, the principle of priority, the principle of typification, so having types. And I definitely want you to understand synonymies. So if I gave you a problem, be able to figure out which one gets, which one gets priority. So we are done for the semester. I hope that you all had fun. Please come with any questions you have and I will see you when we meet again.
See you later, guys.